So welcome to Rutland, to our, this is our fourth event, sponsored by the Smithsonian, Nash Humanities, the Library, 300th Anniversary, Big Y, lots and lots of sponsors. This is our talk on healthcare. And uh, we're going to let these ladies and gentlemen uh, tell you what they know about healthcare in Rutland which I think many of you sitting here already know about healthcare in Rutland. <laughs> My name, Carrie Remington, librarian. Welcome, and I'm so glad to see you all here. Thank you very much for coming. All right, I can usually project, but I will use it. Okay? I'm Peg Sullivan, and I'm the moderator for this I'm not going to hold it. Being, being of an age, I do have notes because I can't remember it all. Right? So if you'll pardon me occasionally, I will look down just to cue the memory. Um, so today, as Carrie said, we are doing a presentation on health care in Rutland. Um, probably 90% of you in this room know as much, if not more, than I do. <laughs> I'm waving to her. All right, so with me today is Edmund Budkowitz, longtime resident of Rutland, who will take you on a, a journey through Rutland Heights Hospital. Okay? And we have Tom Rushala, former fire chief here in town, who will tell you about the hospitals as well as early EMS, emergency medical services, here in town. Um, okay. And we have Evelyn Murphy here, who is going to do kind of a retrospective on her grandmother, and I'll just let her do it. And then finally we have Bonnie Fateau. Does this raise up? It comes off. It comes off. There you go. Sing to the mic. Okay. Mm -hmm. No, you didn't want me to say. <laughs> so we have um, Bonnie Fatou, who will tell us a little bit about being um, administrative at Rutland Heights Hospital. And then finally, we have Rich Stevens, who is the health agent, former Barry firefighter, mm -hmm. and chief in Templeton and Phillipston. And can get it? health agent for the town. Yeah. So um, I want to call him senior coordinator of the vaccine program, and that's how we'll wrap it up. Um, unless your question is a burning issue, if you could wait till the end and ask a specific question, okay? Honestly, it'll throw me off my game. So, all right. So, Rutland, okay? As early as 1780, Dr. John Warren, um, surgeon for the American Revolutionary Forces, sent a British physician up here to Rutland to recuperate his health. Um, so it's, it's been longer than that, but specifically that's kind of where it starts. All right, another factor certainly was the presence of a large prison camp for returning British soldiers to rehab them to the community a lot of them stayed, as some of you very well know, the Hessians. Peter will tell me if I'm wrong. Okay. Um, so, TB has been in existence forever. As far back as 5,000 years ago, it is recorded. Hippocrates taught about this disease, thithis, and it's a Greek word that means wasting or consumption. Okay. So, the names of some of the sufferers, and you might recognize some of them. Um, Henry VII, who was the father of Henry VIII. Edward IV, his son, who died of TB at 15 in 1553. Again, Pocahontas in 1616. Jane Austen, 1775. John Keats in 1795. Emily Bronte, 1848. Henry David Thoreau, 1862. George Orwell, 1950. Eleanor Roosevelt, 1962. And Vivian Leigh, in 1967. So just some names that you would know, and many of us didn't know that they died from TB. Although Eleanor also had pneumonia, which is what put her over the edge. Okay. 
So, and countless others, and nameless others. So, by the dawn of the 1900s, and that's kind of where our healthcare history starts, okay, it's estimated that one in seven persons who had lived died of TB. Um, the 1895 report from Johns Hopkins states that 65% of the city of Baltimore was infected with TB. Wow. As was the case in many of the other larger cities. Okay? Um, extreme poverty, overcrowding, inadequate diet, and unsanitary conditions are all great spreaders of TB. So, the 1822 discovery of the bacillus by German physicist Robert Koch and the discovery of the cathode ray by Wilhelm Röntgen and discovery of radium by Marie Curie added to the public health and medical communities to accept contagion as a cause for TB. Okay. And about the same time, the public health efforts were to start containing. Just previous, Edward Trudeau in 1884, validating Koch's theory that contagion was the spreader, founded a sanitarium in Saranac Lake, New York. And his fresh air cure was what started what we all know about here of hanging them out the windows and letting them sleep on the porch and raising up the windows and sleeping in the cold. A lot of exercise, good diet and he was curing people, okay? The first state-operated hospital in the United States opened on October 3rd, 1898. You have a picture of that building? I do. You do? Would you show them the picture? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. This opened on Central Tree Road, or as it was called then, Elm Street Lane, okay, overlooking Lake Mushapog. The lake became a source of public water as well as for use by the hospital, for which the town was paid $100 a year. At 1,200 feet elevation, the area is suitable for healing and health without with air that is dry and suspected, supercharged with ozone. That is from the front page of the Boston Globe on November 10th, 19, uh, 1898. Okay. So, admitted early to the hospital were the less severe stage more treatable than that advanced stage. At $4 a week charge, long waiting lists led to being in more advanced stage by admittance and doctor's recommendations that people come in. By 1904, the capacity was at 250 patients a day and changes to requirements such as waiving the fees and these doctor's applications in an effort to gain earlier treatment. Treatment was constant life in the open air. The rental of fur coats allowing the patients to walk and sit outdoors, regular exercise, frequent meals, and constant supervision by doctors and nurses. Those of us that are still in the field know that that doesn't happen anymore. Right. In the first 50 years, the state sanitated admitted 21,304 patients and eventually treating the day it closed to 25,381 patients. Right. As it was the first state institution in the United States, it was carefully observed by physicians and public health authorities of many states. Soon after opening, a number of private institutions were started here in Rutland. And I think both Tom and I will cover some of those. I've got the poster over there. Shows those, not all, but some of those private sanitariums. Um, I will beg forgiveness. I don't know if any of the buildings are still standing. I couldn't find anything. Yeah, I got pictures here. Okay. <laughs> So, one of the first was the Jewish Sanitarium of New England, 
founded in 1927 by four ladies from Boston um, to provide a place for those struck by TB to recover. It had 20 beds, okay, later up to 30. It was non-sectarian, leisure, the latest methods in medicine and recreation. Available on site, x-ray machines, a full dental clinic, and breathing machines. <coughs> Opened in 1936 and moved in 1952 to Boston under the name New England Sinai Hospital. It now houses 172 beds. Okay. It was located where the Naquam School stands now. Is this the Jewish? Yes. Okay. <laughs> So, in 1903, the prison camp hospital opened up to rehabilitate prisoners from Massachusetts and to keep them away from the healthy prisoners. Obviously, to stop the spread of the disease. It operated until... 1934. 34. <laughs> so, all the prisoners at that time were moved to the Norfolk House of Correction to make way for the Quabbin Reservoir um, takeover. Okay. Now, I am not going to go into the prison camp because Jeff Kennedy does just the most amazing presentation. So stop by downstairs and see his pamphlet, and hopefully we will get him up here to do more presentation on just the prison camps. Okay. By the private scenes in Rutland included the Clark House, Hunter's Lodge, Summit House, McBride House, Maple Lodge, and two Crane Sanitarium. House many on the waiting list waiting for the state hospital to admit them. Until the decreases in TB due to changes in treatments and all private hospitals were phased out. Medications started coming into effect in the early 1940s. Okay? Um, they used streptomycin and another med with a name this long. I'm not say it. Okay. So, the VA hospital, the grounds were purchased by Dr. Bayard Crane in 1921, the 86 acres on Maple Avenue that we know as Rutland Heights Hospital. Okay. It was called the Hospital for Treatment of Consumptives and TB Patients. Um, the treatment of the TB for World War I and Spanish American War veterans, residents of New England. And with a connection to me and my husband, his father actually died there in 1948. Okay. He was housed there. He was a sergeant, first class U.S. Army, served in France from 1917 to 1919. Right. It opened on May 15, 1923, 288 beds for TB patients, 175 beds for general medical surgical patients. After the state Sam closed in 1963. Five. Five. Okay. All staff and patients moved to Rutland Hospital, as it was called at the time. All right. In 1965, it was renamed Rutland Heights Hospital. All right. The Rutland State Sam and Rutland Heights Hospital. A new era begins with the advent of medications to treat the disease in the 1940s. Um, some surgical treatments for TB, you don't want to know, um, were plumbage. What's that? Thank you. <laughs> it is the insertion of ping pong balls oh. or other methods. They used fat, they used gauze in order to collapse the lung to make it easier for these patients to breathe. Yikes. But that went out of use. Um, Thoracoplasty, which is the permanent collapse of the lung. Okay. And oh phrenolysos, phrenol, 
I can't read my own writing. Anyways, the crushing of the nerve which controlled the diaphragm. Oh. Oh. So if the diaphragm didn't move, they were struggling oh to breathe. Oh my goodness, I'm not breathing. In 1965, until closing, the Rutland served many, many people of different abilities, etc. Um, and Bonnie Fateau is going to tell us a little bit about being there from 65 to 91. 69 to 91. 69 to 91. Okay. Um, by that time, the state has moved in different directions. So there was the CASED unit which was the Center for Alcohol and Substance Abuse Diseases, and it was an inpatient program that served the physical, psychological, social, and emotional issues of people suffering from addiction. Okay. There was the two-week court-mandated program for driving under the influence um, to make people aware that they really did have a problem and to hopefully put them on the path of regaining their lives. Okay. And long-term care, okay? Mostly neurological accidents, ventilator dependent um, from automobile accidents or skiing accidents or just disease, okay? The patients were sent to the long-term long care facilities around the state, and I was on the Friends of Rutland Heights, and we fought that from... 85 to 91. And I remember the last 13 patients leaving Rutland Heights Hospital to go to the Oriole Healthcare, um, where Holden Hospital, the old Holden Hospital was, and stayed there until I believe around 2012 when Oriole revamped their nursing home and made it also rehab. So those patients now reside there. Okay. So, there's a lot of history. I did not and could not get it all on paper. Okay, I'm hoping that you will spend some time in the Rutland Historical Society and go through some of the books and find out even more. But I hope this piques your interest. So, some fun facts about the state sanitarium. 1898 to February 1963, as I said, 25,381 patients. The turnover there. Patients coming in, leaving, and new ones coming in. About 350 to 500 per year. Okay. That's a lot of admission and discharge paperwork. <laughs> um, the first established establishment of waterworks in the town to allow for fire and domestic use. Um, the bill passed that the same day they passed the bill to build the sanitarium. Okay. Um, a volunteer fire department was established as soon as town water became available. <clears throat> the monies raised by dances and entertainment, $500 to $700, built their very own engine house okay, and 500 feet of hose. <clears throat> then that's next to the library, right, sitting up on the hill. In 1909, the Rutland State Sanitarium School of Nurses was founded, and the first supervisor, 1898 to 1912, Mary Thrasher, 1912 to 1915, Sarah Crawford, and in 1916, Del Yonati, a Worcester City Hospital graduate, became the principal administrator of the nursing school. She trained, they'd all trained, but she trained um, students and they went out on affiliation to different hospitals around Massachusetts. They included Worcester City Hospital, Cooley Dickinson, Boston Floating, which is now part of Tufts, and Boston City Hospital, my alma mater. Miss <laughs> um, Nardi <coughs> is the aunt of my oldest friend, Teddy Lofgren from Holden. Uh, the school closed in 1939, and many of the graduating nurses stayed in Rutland, and some of them worked Rutland Heights Hospital for years. Okay. All right. These are some of the rules for treatment at the SAN. Okay. This was your daily routine. Up at 6.15, have your cold bath. 7.15, eat your breakfast. 
Following that, work, rest, exercise. At 12 noon, your lunch. 1.30 to 3 o'clock, rest. 3 o'clock, exercise. Dinner around 6 and in bed by 9 o'clock with lights out and your windows open. <laughs> One of the staff's first job in the morning was to shovel snow off the patient's beds while they were on the porch sleeping. <laughs> Patients were to dress sensibly. Hands and feet were warm, but head cool. In other words, don't worry. In 1953, there were 839 TB sanitarium in the U.S. The emphasis still rest, diet, exercise. Um, so what contributed to Rutland being that first one? High altitude, sunlight, and cold air. Okay, the freshest air in the state came from Rutland. Okay. Another headline in the Boston Globe. Um, just some small statistics, I don't want to bore you with a bunch of numbers, okay? Deaths Due to TB in New England in 1800, about 370 per 1,000. In 1898, 250 per 1,000. 1900, 200 per 1,000. 1920, 100 per 1,000. 1946, 48 per 1,000. 1962, 5 per 1,000. And 1977, which is where the statistics stopped, 1.9 per 100,000 patients. So it's no work. We have come a long way. 65 years, the treatment of TB in Rutland was the principal industry of this town. All right. Um, thank you. I'm going to. Yes? Any idea what their diet was? <laughs> yes. You said they gave them healthy food. About 3,500 calories a day. Wow. Many of them came in. It's called the wasting sickness because the body worked so hard trying to fight this bacteria, bacillus, that they did lose weight. And that was usually the first indicator that something was wrong, then followed by the cough and then the, the difficulty breathing. But 3,500 calories, many of these patients put on a lot of weight. In fact, in fact, in the Historical Society, there is a CD that follows a patient from admittance to discharge. And it's amazing that he comes in this scrawny, sickly looking man and goes out in his coat, barely buttons here. And he's put on probably 20, 25 pounds. So that didn't last forever. That around 1917, 18, they decided that normal calories along with the health and the exercise and rest would um, take care of the, you know, using up the calories. And of course they were getting better too. Um, all right, so I'm going to turn this over to Ed for a minute. No, I'm sorry, take that back. Can I, can I ask? I'm going to turn this over to Bonnie. And she's going to tell us about the last days of Rutland Heights Hospital. Put your hand higher. With, with the decline of, um, of patients um, dying from, from the disease, was it, was it attributed to care, medication, more medication available? In the beginning, no. No, because there was no medication. There were these treatments that they were doing, this sarcoplasty, yeah. where they would open up the chest from here to the back yeah. and, you know, remove out pieces of the lung. Oh. Um, God, they, the food was probably better than some of them had ever had. What they okay. And the rest, enforced rest, and the exercise, the health care, just maybe a different attitude really helped. It wasn't until the 40s, um, after the discovery of streptomycin, penicillin, et cetera, that, that they started thinking we could use it. Yeah. How contagious was tuberculosis? Um, all right, sitting in this room, maybe not so much for the brief time you're here, but living with this constantly, and think about what conditions were like in the big cities, the tenements, the huge influx of immigrants and the crowding was what really and truly contributed significantly to the spread of the disease. And there wasn't a septic system. 
most likely not. There wasn't a septic system, so waste was in the street and stuff. Right. So, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, while Bonnie's on the way up, I just want to say those <laughs> pictures that I passed around of all the different sanatorium and other ones are postcards from Rutland. Yeah, and sure. I want to just I add in there what Peg was just it. saying. One of the, I collect a lot of Rutland postcards, and I think one of the interesting things is to read the backs of them, the people right home, mm -hmm. and you'll find that the vast majority of them is just what she had just said. People write home and say, um, "If I gain the doctor said, if I gain another six pounds, I can come home next week. Or if I gain another ten pounds, I'll be on the way home." So that's what they were doing, fresh air and trying to put those pounds on so they could get out. Wow. Oh, and I also afterwards, uh, these books here are more postcards similar to those pictures you see of the different Rutland Heights State Sanatorium. Um, the Summit Sanatorium and the Prison Camp Hospital. I went to work at Rutland Heights in uh, <coughs> 69. Uh, somebody said to me my first day, what did you come to work here for? We're closing the 1st of July. And we closed the 1st of July every year I worked there <laughs> until it did close in 91. It was just the state saw this as some boom town facility. In fact, when the feds were trying to close the place, they flew people into Athol so that they could show them how far out in the boonies this place was. <laughs> Never mind Worcester Airport, right around the corner. But it was a great place to work. Everybody cared about everybody. I mean, it's an old cliche, but it's like it was family. When I started working there, there were, um, it was predominantly long-term care and rehabilitation. This is before everybody under the sun had rehab facilities. And they had some of the old treatments for that that were left over from when the VA was there and they were treating um, the TB people. There was an iron lung that was still sitting around just collecting dust, which was really rather interesting to see because I knew nothing about any of this when I went to work there. And they had a huge, some huge whirlpool uh, apparatus. One of them was called a hub, a hub tank, yeah. I think yeah. it was, yeah. and it was big. Uh, <laughs> you could have had a party in it. <laughs> and they still used it right up to the end. Uh, I saw a lot of changes at Rutland. I saw the advent of the Cassad unit which again was the Center for Alcohol and Substance Abuse Disorders. It was developed by um, Dr. Stu Foreman, and who, in, who also developed the PTSD program. Uh, it, that program, the CASAD program was roughly a 30-day stay. We did do detox for, for a while, uh, but finally they left detox to Worcester, which the nursing staff was not too unhappy about. Because um, let me tell you, some of these people came in from not the best of areas, uh, so that we had a lot of little buggy things and stuff like that. So we weren't unhappy to see the detox stay in Worcester. But the program itself did very well. Uh, there was a very good recidivism rate, which is returning, and it was a low rate. Uh, these people did well. And eventually, all the insurances and all paid for it, which was a bonus. Um, Rutland Heights did not look at payment prior to admission. Not like today. Uh, that's one of the big changes I saw. Nursing staff did not care who paid the bill. We didn't care if anybody paid the bill, as long as they paid our bill. Mm -hmm. um, but there was no interest in that at that time.
today, that's the first thing anybody needs to know is who's paying the bill. And uh, let's see, what else? Rutland, and then there was the DUI program was the next big program. And that was a two-week court-mandated stay for the treatment of alcoholism. But it wasn't really treatment. It was more so that you would realize you had a problem and then they would help you find uh, treatment when you were discharged. It, and it was a very good program. It's still in existence today, obviously just not in Rutland. I think the program eventually moved to City Hospital when we closed. Where it went after City, I'm My not... My dormitory. My dormitory, 68 Jake's Ave. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, but it's still in existence. It was a good program. Mm -hmm. And then there was the PTSD program, which uh, was the post-traumatic stress, which at that point, most of what they did with post-traumatic stress was bringing people back to the stressful situation. Well, they did that on their own, waking up screaming in the middle of the night and all. So they did a, a more theoretical approach. They, they uh, talked about how to avoid these dreams and how to react when you had them. And it was a, a fairly effective program. And they're still using many of the principles today. And again, that program was developed by Dr. Stu Foreman. Uh, at one point, we ha Rutland Heights housed the, um, a mentally retarded program, which is, that's what they called it then. I know that's not the proper terminology today. But they um, had a place, and they would come over and actually help on the nursing units. They made beds and transported patients, etc. Uh, when that closed down, and one of the major psych hospitals closed, <laughs> they opened a unit at Rutland Heights. Not, it wasn't run, it was totally independent from the public health hospital. And never will mental health and public health live together peacefully. It didn't work. They had totally different rules. Uh, they had different commissioners. It was just, it didn't work. So they got rid of that. Um, and that's when the DUI actually came in because it gave space. And like I said, Rutland was going to close when I got there. But in the mid-80s, it got kind of really pushed. And we all knew it was coming, we just didn't know when. There was a lot of fighting that went on, fight, good fighting. Uh, like Peg said, the Friends of Rutland Heights Hospital, they would go down to Boston every time there was any kind of a hearing and they would support the hospital. Um, there were, you know, they were, they were really good about it. And, but it didn't work. So they started closing slowly. They stopped first. They stopped admitting, and from not admitting, they went. Social services were pushing discharge, um, and they were discharging to nursing homes. Part of the problem was the old way of payment for the patients at the hospital was flat rate. The cute little old lady that only needed help with her medicines receive the same amount, you receive the same amount for that cute little old lady as you did for the young adult who had a car crash and was comatose. Mm -hmm. Paid the same amount. So what's a nursing home going to do? They're going to take the cheap one. You know, the one that they can hire the less help and blah, blah, blah. So, but now that they've changed it, they're now paying by acuity. The little old lady might get so much a day, but the person in that person in the coma might get four times as much. So it now behooves the nursing home to take some of these people and not to take some of the cute little old ladies. Uh, and that's what really changed the whole thing and 
sent Rutland a death sentence because now we're not getting all of these patients that require a lot of care that nobody else wants. So um, that's when the real push to close came in. And like I said, about mid eighties, it got it got really pushed. And by the time they finally got the order to close, there weren't all that many patients. There was still a lot, but not all that many enough that they could get them out to the nursing homes or other chronic hospitals elsewhere in the state that they hadn't gotten to yet, but they were coming to. Um, and the hospital did close in 91. I was finished in September of 91. They closed in November. So I had a good run for closing the six months after I started. Uh, and, but it was a phenomenal place to work. The people still talk about how good of a place it was to work. And there's just not as many of us left as there were. That plaque over there is on the bookcase, that is a slate from the roof of the hospital that one of the nurses painted. Now she did a few of them, and uh, that one is mine, and it's, it's on the slate from the roof, and it's a picture of the hospital. Mm -hmm. cool. uh, about the time it closed, part of the hospital, not all of it. Um, because a lot of those buildings had been torn down at that point, and it, you didn't dare go in them. Uh, they weren't safe. Did you have a question? Well, it was about tore, tearing down the, all the buildings. I can't hear you. It was about tearing <clears throat> down all the buildings. Yeah. Why were they torn down? It's too old to repair? For one thing, they were all asbestos. Oh, and not in good repair. We had an administrator that liked to send money back to the state every year. And every year the place went and more de got more decrepit because of that. Um, and the state thought he was wonderful. He would send the money back. And, um, but the ish. It was not in good repair. <coughs> it, the electrical was old. The water was old. The heating system was a separate building, and they piped the heat up into all the other buildings on the on the grounds, uh, and that was old. And there's a little pond there that they used to call Sputum Pond. I think that was left over from when it was TV. <laughs> But, uh, you know, at one place, at one time, that place had a golf course, it had tennis courts. It, it was quite a place. It had a full theater uh, that could house, that, that could sit hundreds of people with the big velvet curtains and the whole bit. I mean, it was it was quite the place. Where did all the debris go? Where did all the debris go when they knocked it down? What they do with it all? I'm sorry. We have hearing aids and I forgot the book. Oh. <laughs> Brilliant, I know. Where did all the debris go? All the bricks and the asbestos? And Supposedly it all got taken away and cost to, multiple yeah. millions of dollars to, to do. I don't know. <laughs> For one thing, I was in Florida and I came home and was driving up Maple Ave one day and, I, and something wasn't right, <laughs> you know. Something wasn't right. I didn't know what it was. And then it hit me. There wasn't a hospital. It wasn't there. But um, supposedly they did it all correctly with the people inspecting and all of that. Um, do I believe it? I don't know. <laughs> I worked for the state a long time. I don't know if I believe it. Um, I mean, I saw how they cut corners, but uh, it still was a fantastic place to work. Right, Mary? Yeah. <laughs> I agree. Somebody back there. I'm not going to be able to hear you. Becky, Karen. You know me. You were my boss. <laughs> Just the boss. I didn't hear what you said either. <laughs> Becky, Karen. Oh, oh Becky. You know me. You were my boss. I haven't read And I'm bringing it. I worked in the PT. Oh, I know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> we were the, 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 the 
Okay, any other questions? Yes, I have one. That was behind me. What? How many people worked at the hospital? How many people worked at the hospital? How many worked at the hospital? Really? Yeah. 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 I didn't make the VA. I was in 69 and they closed in 65. That's a lot of people. Oh, yes. Something down here. Yes. So, can you hear me okay? Uh, a little louder. A little louder. So, yeah. considering your time on the Kassar floor, no, what were the that. things that they did back then yeah. that contributed the most to um, patient care? In particular, what helped with patients gaining understanding that they had a problem? That would be the DUI program. Uh, they would. They would talk about the characteristics of alcoholism um, and how they related to the individuals. And not, not by saying you, you this or you that, you know, but I mean, in just in general. Um, most of them listened. Did they all take it to heart? Obviously not. Um, but it was the two-week program was really all just to show that you have a problem because you're not going to do much therapy in two weeks. The CASAD program, it was usually around a month and they came in knowing what they were. In fact, we had people that went from the DUI to the CASAD program. Uh, and that was, there was a lot of education in the CASAD program and a lot of individual counseling. I used to, I used to do a, a, a monthly lecture on the physiological aspects of alcoholism. They loved me. <laughs> I mean, talk about boring. Uh, but it, it was, they wanted it, so they got it. But, um... All in all, if the place was still there today, I would have retired from there. Mm -hmm. I did retire from there, <laughs> just when I was 54, <laughs> when it closed. So, was there um, the Filipino nurses oh, yeah. that came? We had Filipino yeah. nurses at one point. There was a nursing shortage. State facilities were not well. We didn't recruit well. We, 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 we had a recruitment tee at one point, and I used to tell people, 100% of those that attended applied for a job. Yeah, well, we had one person attend, and she did apply for a job. Uh, but the Filipino nurses came. Uh, I believe the friends sponsored that. We paid for five contracts to bring them over and to give them salary and housing for a year. And they Not were sure um, how many stayed, but many did. Mm -hmm. They were qualified nurses. They were excellent. Yeah, they were. Uh, mostly they were off shift, mm -hmm. uh, just because that's where the biggest need was. Yeah. But they they all spoke good English. Mm -hmm. Not like some of these you get today that mm -hmm. you can't understand. They all um, their families. But they all spoke good English. Becky, you had some on your floor. But they had to leave families and children. It was very sad. <coughs> they had to do that. So, but it, it, that was towards the end, too, yeah. so that. Uh, 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 towards the end. It wasn't gotcha. at the end. Yeah. But. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that I'd like to, to bring up that Bonnie didn't mention was that the hospital actually paid for her 
to go to nursing school. Let me tell you that. The it's full ride. Okay. Well, actually, oh, no, yeah. they didn't pay for me to go. They paid my salary while I was gone, which was better. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had to pay day. my, uh, Becky, you did it too, yeah, right? you had to work one day a week to get your 40 hours salary. Um, it was nice. I, uh, they, I had to pay my own tuition, <coughs> uniforms, books, all of that. But I got, I was an aide then. I got my salary, a five day a week salary every week for the two years I went to school, which was far better than them paying for just tuition. Because <laughs> the tuition was $100 a semester. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't mind. In fact, what was it, Sandra, a few years ago? What? School? 1500 I don't even know. Yeah. Couldn't believe it. It was... Yeah. It's like 100 a credit up. now. Yeah. Well, so... Did I just see another hand somewhere up there? <laughs> well, I was just, you know, mentioning that, that, we had, that we had to work, you know, and pay back in time. Yeah. After the education. You had to work. What? Well, indentured servants. We had to work. We had to promise yeah. to work at Yeah, we did have to pay them back in time. Yeah. Uh, you had to do double what you were actually on leave for. <laughs> Well, you needed a job anyway. Yeah. You know, so. <laughs> uh, so many was left. It paid for it. I benefited greatly by it, didn't I? <laughs> and this one followed my footsteps. That's my daughter. <laughs> Thank you, Bonnie. Okay. Show them. I'm going to bring Edna Nuss now. Edna's a long time member. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm still. I'm me. All right. We're going to have Evelyn. <laughs> Hi, I'm Evelyn Murphy and I'm a long-term Rutland, lifetime Rutland resident um, who has collected stories from nurses um, for many, many years. I'm a nursing historian. And I became interested in nursing when I was a little, little girl because my grandmother, Elizabeth Smith, was a nurse and she worked at the Jewish sanatorium and told me stories about that. She uh, came up from Worcester uh, in 1925 and uh, worked there shortly after for a number of years. So I wanted to say a little bit about her story and some of the, it, it's a hundred years ago of history. Um, I became a nurse um, based on her influence and also my other grandmother, but um, my earliest exposure to patients was at Rutland Heights Hospital. I was um, actually first, in my freshman year of high school, I became a, um, a babysitter for Evelyn and Bob praised children while Evelyn worked third shift and I would take care of them after school until uh, Bob came home from Mans. Um, so that was the first kind of nurse connection I had and she told me about volunteer um, opportunities there. And so uh, when I was about 15, I started volunteering at the hospital, pushing the vets to their various activities. And I know that um, Ed's going to tell you about the physical plant of the hospital. Pushing people in wheelchairs was a, a big job. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was built like a military um, facility so that it couldn't go up with one bombshell. And um, so everything was far, far apart. So it was very uh, good exercise. And I remember um, the vets were wonderful to work with and they all called me Blondie. Um, <laughs> When I became a nursing instructor, uh, I taught at St. Vincent Hospital School of Nursing and I affiliated my students at the Rutland DUI program. So every, um, every student that graduated um, from St. V's during a certain period of time came up to the DUI program and taught the people in that program about nutrition, about good nutrition. And they brought all this kind of fake food and they showed them the, you know, the, the food pyramid and then they would ask for volunteers to come up and create, create a healthy meal. And most of them were guys and they, they really loved it, loved the student nurse. 
so that that, that, that was kind of fun. I also um, served on the, and it hasn't been mentioned yet, the, the, the Citizens to Retain Rutland Heights Hospital. And we worked around um, getting, not allowing a prison to replace the hospital. And although the hospital survived a bit longer uh, than that, a prison did not come in. And uh, I had a lot of friends in the prison system that um, sent us information about what really went on and what kind of a threat it would be to our local community. Mm -hmm. So um, going back to my grandmother who, who um, worked there, 100, almost 100 years ago. She originally, um, she graduated from um, Massachusetts Homeopath Homeopathic Hospital. This is her diploma, uh, 1915, um, which was five years after Florence Nightingale uh, died. So she and Florence lived in the same period of time, which I think is really kind of neat. Um, This was her graduating class, um, and she's right there. And she, the day that she received her pin, which is a big deal in nursing, uh, this is a picture of her on the top of um, University, what's now University Hospital, the Mass Memorial um, Group. So these are, are, are treasures to me. You'll see. Um, if you remember, nurses of that time, they wore big bibs oh, and absolutely. kind of prison garb dresses underneath. Yep. My grandmothers were long, um, bibs and the sleeves were long, but this is, this decrepit wow. thing is my student uniform. Wow. <laughs> it doesn't look that much different, except it's a bit shorter and I had short sleeves. Um, <laughs> hideous, right? <laughs> All toasted uh, with starch from the, um, the hospital ironing thing. Uh, nurses at that time, when they were students, were not allowed to wear a wristwatch because they possibly could get a germ from not washing properly. So this was my grandmother's gift when she was uh, pinned. This was her nursing watch. Uh, you could wear it on a pin and tuck it inside your bib in a pocket, or you could wear it um, with a ribbon around your neck, underneath your bib. Um, I graduated from Worcester City Hospital, which was the longest continuous nursing school in the United States, 106 years, and had the honor of addressing the last graduating class in 1992 at Mechanics Hall um, at the bequest wow. of my faculty, which was, was a huge honor. A lot of things were similar between in a hundred years, uh, but the equipment changed, and I thought you would be uh, fascinated by, by some of the things that, um, that I have. This is a public nurse uh, bag. If you graduated from a nursing school and became a registered nurse, you generally work for public health. You worked independently, you were out in the community, uh, you did a lot of um, testing, Tuberculosis testing was was huge thing. Um, I have my grandmother's fix her her little tuberculosis for planting purified protein derivative. It's not disposable. It has a little tiny wire that you cleaned it out with, um, and um, it's kind of freaky. <laughs> this all predates disposables, of course, and I have a box that her pure gum gloves were in. Those have disintegrated absolutely to dust, but you washed them and dried them and powdered them and reused them. Um, all the her scissors, I took them apart, they, they came apart to clean, now I can't get them back together, but <laughs> they boiled everything um, to sterilize, which as we now know is not quite adequate. Before um, the advent of plastic, and even before the advent of rubber, if you needed to be catheterized, you all know what that mm -hmm. is, right? Mm -hmm. It was with glass. <laughs> so don't move. <laughs> Even better, 
Yes, you did. Yes. An enema? Again. She said tubing. Now these could be boiled, wash and boiled. That's the way it was. And this got this is all a hundred years old. It's kind of these babies. And you're still alive. So. I'm still alive. <laughs> She's not alive. We're still alive. Wow. Um, We've come a long way. Yeah. Oh, one other thing that that I have. Now there weren't many there weren't many medications a hundred years ago. Really nothing. This is one of them. They're little tablets. It's strychnine. So oh, my oh my gosh. Okay. It's good for giving oh, a boost to your heart and your muscles because it causes a spasma. 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 It also stimulated the bowels. And I did read that a couple of Olympians that got gold medals um, there. This was a performance enhancing drug as well. It's sometimes used against their will. Oh, so, um, I thought that that was, that was kind of interesting. Um, so I did wonder a little bit about um, the hospital that my grandmother trained at. And uh, so I looked it up to see if it was known for anything. And I found that Dr. Joseph Murray uh, excised the first kidney there. This was before any kind of transplantation occurred. And I went, gee, I remember like a Rutland story having to do with this, and I think some some of you might uh, have known that the very first kidney transplant was on a Rutland resident, um, the Herrick, yes, the Herrick twins. So Ronald donated his kidney to Richard, and uh, Richard had grown up on the Herrick farm. This was um, Virginia, Ginny Griffin's two brothers. And he went into the Coast Guard and came back, and he was in very bad kidney failure, and he was he was going to die. And um, Dr. Murray, who was a Harvard lecturer, proposed this surgery, and there's quite a few articles that call him a fool, a crazy man, that, you know, that this was idiotic. But um, they went and did it, um, and Richard survived eight years longer. Uh, his brother died in his, um, I think, his 80s, so he, he with one kidney, um, lived a pretty normal life. And ultimately, um, 18 successful transplants were done um, by Dr. Murray, who did receive a Nobel, Nobel Prize as a result of that. So I thought that was a, a pretty cool Rutland connection um, and um, you know, connected to it. Um, as I am connected to many, many things. Um, so that's just the stories, uh, one story that I have. Um, I did, um, in, in my doctoral studies, collect the, the um, stories, the narrative stories of his, um, <clears throat> about 90 uh, of the oldest nursing graduates that I could interview, and um, because a lot of the stories that we have and the stuff we knew from that long ago and like those of us left are, are not captured anywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, they're just, you can't pick up a book and read about them. You can't Google them. They're, they're just not anywhere. They died with the people in, unless they, they told someone. So um, I became interested in that. And, um, any questions? Yes? Are you writing a book? <laughs> that's, that's either a sign that I should or a sign that I should. Um, I, yeah, I would like to compel them and um, compress them and yes. Um, another thing that I have is a huge basket of correspondence between my grandfather Lawrence Smith and my grandmother when they were courting and that is also that's like even a more exciting book to me, but because uh, it's Rutland, you know, it, there's a lot of stuff. I was just going to make a comment about the Herrick twins. Yes, I get the newspaper, the Worcester paper, every day, and there's an article in there every year about the first kidney transplant. Fabulous. I don't know that they mention the name, but they do not say that they were from Rutland. I noticed that because I went looking because I. I could vaguely remember this, and so I went looking, 
and I googled their names and then Rutland, I found one article that said they were raised on a farm mm -hmm. in Rutland and then I googled Ginny's obituary to make sure that it was those two men, mm -hmm. um, as I remember being told pretty young. So, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yes, way back. Hi. Hello. <laughs> um, my mother came to Rutland in, uh, I, I would think about the early 1930s. She was born in 1913, so she wanted to be a doctor, but her family couldn't afford it. So she came to Rutland to do her nurse's training at Rutland State Sanatorium. That's where she got her nursing degree. And because of her coming to Rutland and marrying my father, who Evie and I have, my grandfather was Evie's grandfather's brother. brother. Yeah. So, um, but she came and did her nursing degree in uh, at Rutland State Sanitarium. Yeah. She was treated at Rutland Heights too, wasn't she? <coughs> no, no, she she made the transfer. Okay. She worked. She worked when when Rutland State Sanitarium closed. Yeah. She went okay. Over. And she worked nights. Every every year of her nursing career. Yeah, my grandmother worked nights too, and I, it was amazing how they could get a night's sleep just napping here and there. My, my mother used to move her bed over to the her bedroom door and sleep, because my mother could fall asleep anywhere. And she could catnap like you wouldn't believe. And when my brother was was young and wasn't going to school yet, she'd move her bed over in front of the door so that he couldn't get anywhere except <laughs> right, staying right in her bed. <laughs> oh, that, yes. <laughs> I see the wisdom of that. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that. Yes. Um, I was wondering, could I add just a little bit to all of this? Sure. Um, I worked in the rehab department and that was another part of Rutland that... What's your name, sir? Uh, Rennie Karen. And uh, I was a physical therapist there. And um, the great job that the nurses did allowed us to do what we did. And I married one. Um, <laughs> but we worked with patients. We had occupational therapy. We had speech therapy. We had physical therapy. And we also had a, I don't remember what it was called, but it was activity therapy. And they would do activities for the patients. They would take them out on picnics. Matter of fact, we'd have a picnic where the whole hospital was involved. Bonnie would probably remember that. I remember as a volunteer, I got to right. participate. But yeah. we worked with patients who were amputees. Okay. We worked with patients who had strokes. We worked with patients who um, were in car accidents. We even worked with comatose patients, giving them range of motion and things that would help their body stabilize better. Um, I did work with the Hubbard tank. It's a whirlpool. It relaxed people and we would give them range of motion while they were in the, the whirlpool. Um, we did treatments as paraffin. We did uh, treatments as stair climbing. Um, ambulation, walking with walkers, canes, prosthetics. Um, also, too, the occupational therapist would work with patients to help train them how to live at home again. Would teach them how to eat. Sometimes they need special equipment. Would teach them how to dress themselves uh, because they had certain paralysis and they couldn't necessarily dress themselves unless occupational therapy taught them a certain technique to do that. But I just wanted to, to let people know that Rutland was a fantastic nursing facility, but we were also a rehab facility. We have a lot to be proud of. So thank we, you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. was our prized. Yeah. 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 Uh, this was Evelyn's yeah. cap from <laughs> <laughs> when I couldn't have my hair like this. Oh, horror. Yeah. Yeah. And this was mine from Boston City. Yeah. Ah. Ah. Yeah. Just had to bring that. All right. Um, thanks, Evelyn. Yeah. <laughs>
ticket here. Ticket says Central Mass on stage. Oh boy. Can't take it with you. It's at Rutland Heights. That's right. In the theater. And I was in it. Yes, you do. Oh, it's right up here. I remember that. Yes, you do. Yeah. I, I, I wasn't in it, but I got to see the show. Yeah. Matter of fact, there was one scene in it where the other actors were acting, and I was off to the side pretending to work on fireworks, and there were some young kids in front of me, so I would take a pencil, well, actually two pencils, and stick them in my nose. <laughs> they loved it. <laughs> the director got really you know? pissed off at me. <laughs> I bet it was Tom Sope. I bet it too. Yeah. Oh my I won't get into that. But yeah. Anyways, here we are. My first, uh, it's nice to see everybody here. There are a lot of familiar faces. Microphone, Ed. can't hear you. Uh, Mike. Uh, all right, I'll pick it up. Yeah. And, and I, usually I'm not you know, accused of being soft uh, of a voice. Uh, but today I have my hearing aids in, so maybe I'll tone it down. But uh, usually I can speak loud. Uh, when I came, when, when I came um, to Rutland, I was four years old. 1956, and I grew up on Highland Park Road, mm -hmm. and back then you couldn't s you could see pretty well because Highland Park only had about three trees: two in front of Briggs's house and one in front of Taylor's house. Other than that, it was open. So when you looked up the street one side from my house, you could you could see that water tower. It stood out, yeah. and if you, as you worked your way up the street, you could actually see the crest of the hill with all the buildings on it, at least on the crest of it. And one of the things I remember as a kid, I was fascinated what went on inside there. And it was a, a federal facility. So it was very much in the in the genre of a you were on a on a base. Except it was a medical base. And one of the things I remember is if you wanted to go to Worcester, you had to, because most people only had one car back then, and we were one of those type of people, and uh, uh, you had to take the bus. And one thing I remember very well was if you didn't get on the bus before it entered the hospital, you might not get a good seat. And that was true. You'd end up in the back of the bus, and remember, this type of bus was kind of the one that if you've seen a league of their own, that's the kind it was. You know, it was smoky, the back, if you got in the back of the bus, it was noisy, and you couldn't see a thing out the windows, you know, and if you're in the back. So, you wanted to get on the bus first, you got on there, and then you went into the this this wonderful place called Rutland VA Hospital. At the entrance, there was a guard shack. There was a guard at, the, at there, and as you came in, on the right side, there was the superintendent's house, and then there were four duplex townhouse style um, houses, which were uh, basically uh, rented to the doctors and some of the, the superintendent or somebody who was in charge of the physical facility. Uh, those those were the, the families that would reside on those in those houses. Uh, one thing that stood out to me was there was also a uh, an apartment comp uh, not big but there was an apartment on the left hand side and I see Mary because she lived there with her husband <laughs> when it was the state. <laughs> so um, I just want to acknowledge that. And uh, because I was your paper boy <laughs> in the early days. And uh, the thing that I remember was as we went in, they were at that time, because I see some pictures that they were a little different, they were stuccoed. They had to be a, they were of a darker sand color, uh, kind of that creamy, a little bit of orange in there kind of thing. And they were, they were. Uh, two two heights, in other words, two levels, and at that time they were slate roofed in the attic area, so they had a pitched roof and, and slate roofed. And uh, as you went in, if, if you got to be in the front seat, 
you could see all this, and it was a pleasure because after you passed the apartment building on the, the left, there was the golf course. And yes, there was a golf course there. It was a five or six hole golf course. And I remember it because there was a little hoopla at one time that they spent a thousand dollars a green to have them done over in the early 60s. And I know my father and mother paid eight thousand dollars for the house. <laughs> that was a lot of money, you know. And uh, so, anyways, needless to say, there was at least a five, if not six, uh, green uh, golf course there, followed by a tennis court. And after that was a rose garden, and and it was beautiful. You you would step down. That was the thing that was interesting. It wasn't on the terrace. Well, it was a terrace kind of thing. You, you came off the uh, sidewalk and you could step down into it. And, and it was a wonderful place to spend some time and just pontificate, whatever you want. You know, and think, just enjoy yourself. That's before, you know, uh, this mindfulness type thing of, uh, you know, walk with, you know, in the <laughs> moment or something like that. But anyways, it, that was a great thing. And then as you rounded the curve, you had a choice. The bus driver sometimes went up the hill to the rec hall and the... Uh, where they had the uh, kitchen area and the men's quarters, or you took a left in the bend and you went by the powerhouse and the pond, and you made your way around in front. If I can do, here's, here's that bend. It was notorious, I'll tell you, until they straightened it out a few years later. And you would... They would try to make this corner here, and this corner was a toughie for the, the bus. And that, that, the bus usually had to back up and uh, straighten out and then come up this way. That was so that patients or people could enter the bus from the right. And that was a one way. And they did try a few times to change the pattern the other way. But we'd, we'd load up with a lot of people. And, uh, and then they would go around the hospital. And as they ventured down here, they'd take a right and they'd start around the back. And as they were heading around the back, these, you don't have it on this picture, but when I was four years old, they had Quonset huts there. And they were the Quonset huts that were actually greenhouses. And they raised flowers, which they put out here. And as, you, as many of you talk about, I remember asking questions and somebody came back and I said, who does that? And it was a form of physical therapy for many of the patients that would come down and help out. That's what they told me. I'm four years old, can't go back to the source, but that's what I was explaining. And then uh, as we went around, there was a women's barracks right over here, and that was for usually single women that were working, usually nursing staff or something like that, and they were be housed there. And we had a little league field right here, and I'll tell you something, I played a few games there, and uh, it was half of our games at the time were played at the hospital, and half of them were played at Memorial Field. And as you made the journey around, uh, there was a D building, you won't find D building on this particular, as Tommy was telling me, he says, yeah, that's because that's in the 30s, this picture. And the building wasn't built until, I gather, the latter. Early 50s. Early 50s. So uh, you, you find that uh, there's also, uh, as they went through the journey, we came around here, and the bus driver would come in and pull through this little space in here into the parking lot, which serviced both the... Uh, the cafeteria, men's quarters, because there was a men's quarters off to the side, if I can, if I can remember it. Um, I can't see it here too well, but there was a men's quarters that was also very similar to the women's quarters, except for taking care of men. Uh, they, there was a lot of thinking behind this, because if you had a problem, they were there, and you could call them into service. So you didn't have to worry about 
having people in an emergency situation show up. They were there. That was an important thing. Uh, you got to think military. And uh, yeah, in here, in here, I, I will get to the the uh, going up to the uh, the hall. That that is something that I remember very well as I spoke with Rene. Uh, as I got older, my mother ended up working part time in the kitchen. That gave me an opportunity to get on the base, if you don't mind me referring to it on the base, because we would be able to walk a company with my mother, my brother John and I, and the beauty of that was I could fish. I could go down and fish the pond. You know, not that I did much. I was a little too young and my mother wasn't really a fisher person, you know, a fishing person. And uh, it usually broke down to let's go throw the line out a few times and uh, all right, there's a frog over there, there's a turtle over here, and some, you know, you know, it broke down to feeding the fish the, the Cheerios you brought for a snack. <laughs> so um, that was neat, but it also gave me an opportunity to go in the hospital for a change. I found out that I, my, my mom would go up to get her check. Back then, you didn't get direct deposit. You were going to go up and get a physical check so that you could deposit it. You know, so rather than waiting, because she worked in the evening, she had the second, the third shift in the kitchen. Or that would be later than the um, the paymaster and DO. So basically, the federal government, she, I would get in there, and uh, we would take Burma Road. Burma Road was. Anybody who worked at Roland Heights knew what we were talking about. Yeah. It was a network of, uh, it's just a web of basically uh, corridors over, over from between, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little old. And, and it was pitched so that you could use wheelchairs and you could walk without taking any steps. But it was still a heck of a journey because it wasn't an easy one, especially if you had crutches or you were a patient trying to negotiate a wheelchair. So you, you really had to depend upon somebody. If you're heading up that way, could you drop me off at the PX or, and at the, at the rec hall, please? You know, so what would happen is you'd see, it was a very busy, busy way of dealing with things, especially in the winter and inclement weather. And it had a width of at least two wheelchairs and a little bit of space between on both sides and you had uh, in it uh, a railing and a very noisy heating system which was usually uh, steam heat so it keep you warmer in the winter time and uh, they had some windows <coughs> along it that would be able to open up in the summertime because this hospital was not air conditioned that really, you know, I, I talk about having to have a, a hard, I know, when he was sharing about the winter time, well, in the summertime, it wasn't any better. It could get as hot as hell, too, inside. Um, so, windows being open night, I, you know, during the night in the winter time, I mean, the summertime was a, a norm there, too. So, anyways, going up Burma Road. They sprouted off. They went to INK and I forget the other building. G and &H. H. I didn't know what they stood for, but Tommy explained to me what they stood for. If you, well, I, well, I was always told that G and H was going home, and I and K was for the ones that couldn't go home, so it was in for keeps. Oh. <laughs> and and I, I remember playing baseball, and they would bring the in for keeps uh, patients out on the porch. And uh, they would watch the little league games, and uh, they were uh, in 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 tough. Uh, let's say they they had it rough, and some of them couldn't venture out to watch the games, and they would very much often find themselves, uh, you know, looking from their bed, bed, you know, up through this window. Yeah, you know that. And uh, so, anyways, that was my 
experience inside was going up that Burma Road, and it would veer off to the IK, and on the left hand side going up, they had three quads of us. One was for the Jewish faith, one was for the Protestant, uh, you know, uh, services, and there was one for the Catholic services. And uh, being the Catholic faith, uh, they used to have two. Uh, two masses on Sunday. One was six o'clock in the morning, and one at eight o'clock. Uh, I remember those because we used to scoot up there. My father would try to get in, so uh, we could go to drum corps competitions uh, and not miss miss uh, mass. And uh, they were fa they were faster masses, so they were. <laughs> that, that that was also kind of thrown in bonus. Uh, you know what I mean. Uh, but Burma Road uh, was the way that you would continue on to the large mess hall, which was the major main dining hall. There were two mining halls, dining halls, and there were one for um, workers there, usually the upper echelon, and then there was the large dining hall. Uh, but as you made your way up, you, there was a spur that went to the D building, which would have been somewhere over here, and then we go up to the uh, rec hall. And the rec hall I love going to because if I went up with my mother to, to get the paycheck, she'd say, we'll stop in and get you a model or uh, at the PX, or uh, maybe that's where I was introduced to matchboxes. Mm -hmm. You know, so something like that. And uh, uh, I do remember the rec hall, and the rec hall was closed sometimes for the movies because we couldn't get in but they had them for the the patients they had them for for for, for the people that lived there but the nice part was if your mother or father worked there and you were between six and I believe 11 you were eligible to go to the Christmas party and the Christmas party was held in the theater and to be at the theater was a pleasure because I got to see Santa Claus, but I also, they always brought in a good person, you know, and then one of the guests was Bob Cousy, and I was tickle pink when Bob Cousy was there, because he was <coughs> the, the, uh, the head of the, you know, everybody knows him as Mr. Basketball, and he was the, you know, he shared with Bill Russell the, the, the leadership role as the playing members of the Boston Celtics at that time, world champion Boston Celtics. So that was a big thing for me. Um, you also later, got a Christmas pardon? You also got a Christmas yes, I did. Christmas I did. Everybody got an age, age appropriate uh, Christmas present with that. And uh, but it was it was a lot of fun and it was a joy to be able to have that interaction uh, in memory. And uh, from the rec hall. I didn't take the trip down to that hill. That hill was a rather steep hill for a bus that would be full, or not quite full, but at least substantially, uh, substantially uh, a good load. And uh, at the early years, it was a rather, you had to come to a stop to take the turn. Later on, they seemed to adjust that, which it's currently in its, uh, condition that it was adjusted to, but it was far worse before. Um, before I get too far too far out, and, and can you still hear me back there, or am I just phasing in and out? I gotta keep. I gotta lock my lock my my uh, hand in position. I keep my my head in a steady place. Okay. Um, the other thing was my next. Introduction with that was through the affiliation with the drum corps. The drum corps would go up there, and I, I have they 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 were created. They they came out of an idea from four people, and in the town of Rutland, my father was a teacher at the time, and uh, he ended up becoming the director of it, and uh, he made it a point go up and uh, recognize the um, contributions and the sacrifices that people that uh, were veterans of foreign war and 
all, all veterans. And he made it a specific point to have the drum corps play. And uh, even if they didn't make, a, 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 they, they would come from another place, they would take the bus and take a turn and go up and play at the Heights. You know, the, the, uh, the VA made it a point. And I have a couple of brochures here of, of the last two um, programs that they had for um, veterans. One was the Veterans Day of 1964, and uh, there's the other one of Memorial Day, the last Memorial Day of 1965, when it was the, still the Veterans Hospital. And uh, you can see there, they, they put a lot of time into these things. And if anybody wants to see it later, they're more than welcome to. Um, after the, the, the closing of the hospital, there was a pause between it. And uh, during that time of question of closing, I have some, I have a one page, very large page of the uh, questioning of, of, uh, of townspeople about what their concerns were of the closing of the hospital. And uh, there are people in here like Ethel Tucker, Bill Griffin, my father. I'm a junior, so he's got the same name. I've got the same name, but I'm the junior. And uh, Clee Blair, uh, what was it? For those who might want to come up here, Mr. Weller, Charlie um, uh, Vargin, uh, and uh, Ernest Bigelow. These are all, they're all on here, their, their, their opinion about what's going on with the closing of the, the heights. And also, um, good old Father Hughes, uh, he had his, anybody remembers him? I'll just say, I'll just say when I got married, um, the priest said to me, uh, we got married in St. Anne's, my wife and I, and uh, he says, um, where did you go to church? You know, what church? And I said, I went to Rotman Home. He says, who's in, who's that? Father Hughes. Oh, you had it tough. <laughs> 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 he, he was an interesting character. Nice, nice man, though. He had your interest, he did. Um, in here, I have a picture of the drum corps in front of parts of the drum corps members marching in front of the hospital. I suspect it was either a Memorial Day or a Fourth of July because Fourth of July would always go around. Yes? Edmund, you know, you probably don't remember this because you were a drummer and you wouldn't have gone, but the Pfeiffer's always went up in Christmas Carol. Yes. And that's the only time your father played his fife with us. Yes. Wow. He played with us when yes. we were Christmas Carol. Yes, and I, I used to go too, even though I didn't. Oh, you went. I couldn't play it. I couldn't play it, but I went up at the same yeah, time. Yeah, and, and we and our Fourth of July parade was a longer walk than anybody else in the parade. Yes, because we went around the whole entire <laughs> hospital. Yes, we went all the way around the back for the patients. Right, that is correct. That is correct. Um, yes, we did make it a point to go do Christmas carols with the Fifers um, through all the various wards. Uh, for Christmas journey, um, I I want to also get I wanted to focus on the veterans because there sometimes it can be a confusion for new people that come into town because there was a distinct difference. One was the Veterans Hospital, and then the other one was the Rutland Heights, which was state owned, and they came over in November of '65. Um, the Veterans Hospital. Closed, I believe, the 9th of of June. I, I I'm telling you this because I have delivered some things that I had on um, program, uh, a few things uh, to the historical society that talk specifically about the 40th anniversary of Rutland VA and also the starting of Rutland Heights Hospital. It was a new journey, and that meant lower budget. Smaller workforce, a little smaller um, uh, patient load too, uh, but same physical <coughs> plant. That's a very important thing because that meant cost per patient, and that also led to the demise. 
of it. And that's, that, I won't go there because it could be a whole debate. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I have a question. Is it true that the state purchased or leased the hospital for a dollar a yes. year from the federal government? Yes. Um, I did see the original deed search. I did it when I was a member of the planning board. Uh, it, um, I, I did a deed search and it said the Rutland Heights Hospital was leased for 30 years for the cost of one dollar. The um, so um, and they found that out when they did a deed search again under the Weld administration when they tried to sell off as surplus property that they couldn't do it because they didn't own it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I remember that. They didn't own it. And uh, so anyways, the transition, kind of, well, I only wanted to get into the state because I worked there. I worked there for a number of years. I actually came and started in, in the kitchen part-time and I worked in 69 at the same time Bonnie was there. And uh, unfortunately, when you talked about the uh, alcohol rehabilitation, I used to go out and collect the glass and things around 5.30 in the morning and I happened to stumble upon a DUI, no, a, a DT person who was being held down in one of the rooms. So I do know that was not a, let me say, and it was kind of enlightening and very scary. So uh, I'm glad they did put it at City Hospital and stop doing that. Um, from, I'm going to keep it, I'm going to kind of close it up a little bit because I did work there. I did get to know some of the patients. It was a pleasure. It really was. It was a family. I still know that when we, and, and it was a family affair many times because there wasn't just the, my mother ended up working there. I was working there. Um, I know people that had uh, mother-daughter situations and sister-brother or bro sister-sister or, or something like that working there. So it was a part of the community. That was one of the nice parts about it. But I do want to mention one thing. We had a winter carnival in this town a long time ago. And that was one thing that we lost. Mm. And I'm not going to get into it deep, but they held, they held the skating races on the pond now that it was part of the state. And they used it uh, two or three years, I can't remember exactly, but they did do it for a couple years minimal. And that was uh, something that I wanted to uh, remind the the, the part, the camaraderie of allowing the town to be part of the hospital. And that, that and also when they use the theater for like Central Mass on stage. Yeah. I know I could get into more. I worked in the power plant. I did a couple, several years down there. Uh, the, the boiler room basically. It wasn't a power plant. It was a boiler room. And I do understand that. And I did uh, time in there. And uh, I could tell you stories about that. And But I do remember when I left and I was being hired for UMass Medical School um, that day that I walked out the power plant and walked up the meandering road around. I, I, I believe I made it a point to go through the Rose Garden and, uh, and, and out the door. Um, I'll stop here. But I, because there are other people that want to share. But if you want to speak later, I'll be glad to. Are there any questions? And I'll, yes. I was going to say, if you want to look at this, this has all those Kwanzaa pets you were talking about. It's an uh, aerial I have to come. I'm sorry, I can't. Okay, this has the Kwanzaa huts you were talking about? Uh, the Kwanzaa huts are over here. Yeah, some there are here. some over here they would use to, and then there used to be at one time behind the, um, the uh, this particular um, apartment building, they had them there, and um, these were over here, not, the water tower was actually on the top, uh, heading up the hill, and these are actually down below in the lower parking lot where they have them along the, the edge there. Yes, 
I just want to say that you talked a lot about the, the kitchen and the dining hall. Yes. Mm. I just want to reiterate that the food that they made was really good. <laughs> and, and you could buy lunch tickets, 90 cents when I was there. 90 cents a ticket for a whole meal. I, I don't I only paid 30. <laughs> well, I, I, was, I was, I'm older. <laughs> uh, yeah, you could, you could, you could uh, live there. Uh, if you were in the men's quarters or women's quarters, you could, you could eat, eat and, uh, and live there rather cheap. Uh, inexpensively, we'll call it. <laughs> Thanks so much. All right, so following along with firsts in this town, you know, the first state sand in the, in the country, and the first watershed property, um, we're now going to have Tom present. Present. <laughs> oh, good. Thank you, thank you. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Tom Rishala. Um I'm going to just give you a, a real quick rundown of how we got in, the town got into the ambulance service. Um, the picture here, this came out of one of the books you had from the Historic Society. I guess this was uh, somebody's private vehicle that it said in there that was lent from time to time to be used as an ambulance. Of course, it was kind of tough if they went out shopping somewhere or went on a trip, I guess you could use that. So. But what I remember, and that was way before my time. I don't even, that was back in the late 30s, early 40s. Um, I just remember when I was a kid, we always used to just, if we had to go, we had to go to a whole hospital. You had to, your parents had to throw you in the car and go quick. So, um, as as the time went on into probably, I'm going to say the late 50s, 60s, before the early 70s, uh, the, the police department did have, always have a, one of the cruisers was a station wagon. And I remember going to numerous car accidents and stuff. People were hurt rather severely, but the only way they could get to the hospital was you put on a stretch and you put in the back of the uh, station wagon. Mm -hmm. Of course, there wasn't much room back there for them to be able to work on you. Because you, you're, you're in the back and the ceiling is probably three or four inches from your head. And of course, they got as fast as they could down to Old Hospital, which is only, you know, that was probably five, six, seven, eight minutes, of, you know, to get down there. So, so along probably the late 60s, early 70s, uh, a study committee was put together to look at doing something by ambulance service because town was growing, there were a lot more uh, residents here, growing very rapidly, and the study committee came back to the selectmen and recommended that we should have some kind of an ambulance service. So, of course, they, they thought about it for a little bit and decided that the fire department should take that on. Even though the police were doing the station wagon thing, um, they gave us the uh, task of putting the ambulance together. So that program was uh, put together and at that time the state was also revising their plans for emergency pre-hospital care because you know everybody there were a lot of places in the in the Commonwealth that were in the same boat. The place every you know all these towns and cities were growing. A lot of them didn't have them. A lot of them had the same thing. They didn't have an ambulance dedicated to town. <coughs> Some did, but at any rate, we we uh, put the program together. The state did go out to bid for ambulances, and we we were one of the first towns in the Commonwealth to go on to a state bid list to get an ambulance, which is. At one point, they asked us to come down to Boston. So this is a picture. We were in at the state house to uh, display the ambulance, and, and it was a program there that the state was putting on to show this program. So um, these are just some pictures of that getting these, and because we were lucky enough to get there with um, Governor Dukakis and gave us the key. Didn't give us the cost. We had the keys to get there, but the ceremonial key key transfer was then. And of course, the ambulance for a number of years, uh, when we started, it's all, it was all part-time people. Yeah. Most of the people spent their own time and money to go to some class, you know, various classes, but you had to be an EMT. But they put a lot of time, a lot of effort into it. And probably from, well, 1978, we started the ambulance, and 
into the early 90s and mid 90s, it just was getting, we were just getting busier and busier and busier and for part-time people to run an ambulance service is rather difficult. So as we moved along, I became the full-time chief in 1995 and by the early 2000s we were looking at full-time people because we just, you know, daytime, <clears throat> in the older days, daytime we had people either working at Sims Cab or other businesses that people would leave work and come and either go to a fire call or an ambulance call. But as we moved along and those some of those businesses closed down, as we get into the early 2000s, those those businesses weren't here nor were the people in the middle of the day. So we had a very difficult time making sure that we had a crew on. And I don't know how many times I would find out that different people weren't there and I had to call over to the house and say, geez, Byron, were you home today? Because we need another person for the ambulance if we have a call. And numerous times we had to go on a call. The two of us were on the call for a while. So early 2000, we did go to full-time personnel and was that progress? So then we, we pushed and I pushed to get paramedic service, which we did go to. We trained our personnel to uh, come to that part because I felt that was something the town deserved. Holding the hospital closed down in the mid 90s, I think it was. So now we have to go into Worcester with everybody. So it was a situation where, where we had the ambulance service, you people, me, myself, everybody was saying, Well, why are you doing this? You just want, no, yeah, I want, to, I want the ambulance service if something happens to me, but I also want it for everybody else that needs it too. So that's, so that's how we've progressed to that point and to where we are today um, with the full paramedic service. And I think, yeah, I'm pretty sure they're running three ambulances over there now. So that's kind of it in a nutshell, unless somebody's got any questions. How many time, towns are they covering now from, oh, yeah. from Rutland? Um, I think three. Three? Yeah. yeah. They cover more with the dispatch center, mm -hmm. but the ambulance itself covers three. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Ooh. So, if anybody's interested, down the road we will have a full presentation by Tom to go into all of the little things that happened just to get that here and how it came together, okay? So, in the interest of time. Um, next, I'd like to bring up Rich Stevens, who's the health agent for Rutland. Um, as I said, a former firefighter in Templeton and Phillipston. And he is going to talk about bringing... COVID vaccination site to Rutland. Okay. And those of you that don't know, we were the third largest vaccination site in the state. Okay. And we did 100,000 vaccines wow. in and around wow. this library. Wow. I promise I'll be loud. <laughs> it's, the, it's the fire chief voice. I never need a ball on on the fire ground. Uh, a lot of great presentations today, and I've certainly enjoyed learning a lot of the history uh, that I didn't know about Rutland and Rutland Heights, where I grew up on a farm in Barry. We could look over here and uh, see the church steeple, mm -hmm. and we could see the water tower, Rutland Heights. Uh, so I always remembered uh, both of them. Um, I grew up in a family of uh, public health. My grandmother was a registered nurse. We grew up in the farmhouse with my grandparents, my parents, uh, my two sisters, and my great aunt who never left the farm. So I think some of my passion to, to get involved in public health certainly came from growing up with my grandmother who was a registered nurse and public health nurse in the town of Barrie and some of the other smaller communities around uh, Barrie. And I was just a kid right out of college. Yeah, my first, first job in public health was servicing many of the small communities right around Rutland that couldn't afford a full-time health inspector. So I bunched up nine little towns and that's how I made a living doing health inspections in nine different communities. Uh, and I used to kid that uh, being a member of the fire department in Barry, my, my first department, that it was my hobby because I was involved in public health. But the hobby took over later in life and I became uh, a full-time fire chief and worked in two different communities, Temple and Phillips, and retiring four years ago in that capacity. And Chief Rochelle and I certainly have worked together many, many years. 
uh, back and forth in the fire service, and I was interested to hear about the progression of the first ambulance here in Rutland, because in 2008, not too many years ago, I started the first licensed ambulance in the town of Phillipson. They never had ambulance. So 2008 is not that long ago, and here I started the first ambulance, which is still successful today. Um, I, I'm here today to talk about uh, a novel coronavirus, which uh, we, we've all heard a lot about. And the first uh, outbreak was in Wuhan, China in December of 2019. It seems like a, quite a bit of uh, time ago, but it really wasn't. Uh, the World Health Organization uh, declared a public health emergency uh, January 31st of 2020 and a pandemic on uh, March 11th of 2020. Uh, the President of the United States on April 30th launched uh, Warp Speed, an initiative to produce the first vaccine um, to uh, battle the coronavirus as quick as possible. On September 22nd, 2020, United States coronavirus COVID-19 death toll surpassed 200,000 people. On December 11th of 2020, the Food and Drug Administration issued an emergency use authorization in the EAU for the first COVID-19 vaccine, which was for Pfizer, and that was December 11th. Rutland was one of the first uh, established <coughs> regional vaccination uh, sites in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, that uh, we, we established in January 22nd of 21, and that was our first uh, uh, clinic here in the town of Rutland. Uh, very quickly and early on, uh, a colleague, uh, Chief Knight, who you know very well in the town, uh, your fire chief, and I had worked again many years. We went through Quad Regional High School together. Um, we had the we had the benefit of me just retiring and sitting on the board of directors uh, in District Eight, which is 38 cities and towns uh, fire services for the last four years of my fire career, and Chief Knight having a vast experience as fire chief in uh, Rutland and town of Hubbiston, we knew a lot, of, a lot of the fire service folks. So we were able to reach out immediately to the fire chiefs in the area and say, we want to work with you and we want to develop uh, vaccines, especially when we get our hands on it, for your first responders. These are the frontline people right out there every day dealing with our sick people in our communities. So that network was established right off, right off the get-go, and that was a, a great network to have. Um, the first clinic was held in the fire station. It was during January. It was a very cold uh, day. Uh, we had just received a small amount of vaccine. Uh, as, as, as you can imagine, vaccine um, wasn't plentiful, and demand was high all across the United States. So we did a drive-through clinic and we vaccinated all the first responders in 16 communities around Rutland. That was our first debut of vaccinating folks for the coronavirus. Uh, we did a drive-through clinic at the fire station. We moved the fire trucks out and we would open the garage door. We'd bring four cars in. We'd shut the garage door. We'd vaccinate both sides. Uh, we'd, have, we'd have firefighters, EMTs, paramedics. Uh, we had nurses. Um, um, we had undertakers we tried to take care of because uh, they're dealing again with people that died that had died from coronavirus. So it was important to protect our undertakers, our local uh, funeral homes. So we had nurses on both sides. They rolled down the window and we would, we would do the vaccinations, do the quick paperwork, and off they went. We'd let another four guys in. Um, Burger fries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so that was the debut of the first beginning uh, clinics here in, uh, in the town of Rutland. Uh, we, we quickly, the word quickly spread through those 16 communities that Rutland uh, was doing a great job of getting the, the available vaccine out. And phone calls started to come into the public health office uh, asking, how, how are you getting this done? Because we can't get this done. We can't get vaccine. How is Rutland doing this? And we even had some larger communities, the city of Worcester, whatever, calling, asking, how are you getting this done in the town of Rutland? Uh, I had, uh, I had a contact, uh, the Assistant uh, Commissioner of Public Health in Boston, Gianna Ferguson, who just recently retired, started her public health career about the same time I did, around 1986 or 87. So, um, Gianna saw the successes that we had here, uh, getting our first responders in 16 communities vaccinated, and, and some of the local nurses, uh, doctors, we even did veterinaries, uh, veterinary, veterinarians, and, and our funeral homes called me and, and said, "How you know, you're doing a great job, um, can you do more? 
So the law was to take vaccine out to the local communities and set up satellite clinics. So for the first several months, that's what we did. Uh, I want to back up a little bit because there was some foresight with Chief uh, Knight and myself and Scott Gilroy, the chairperson of the Rutland Board of Health, who's got, I think, almost 30 years now as a member of the Rutland Board of Health. Um, we purchased an uh, ultra-low freezer. Now, that freezer goes to minus 80. Now, that's super cold, and that's how the Pfizer vaccine had to be stored at minus 80. We purchased that with the first federal dollars that rolled into Rutland in November. Okay, long before we even had vaccine, we bought that freezer because we knew we needed to be able to store the vaccine. If we were going to be able to push vaccine out in our community, uh, Rutland and surrounding communities, we needed to be able to store that. Now we've had we have a pharmaceutical refrigerator because we've done flu clinics in this community for a number a number of years, but that was a key piece of equipment. Uh, that we bought early on with the first federal dollars that came to Rutland to deal with coronavirus. So, uh, Janice's phone call, we worked with the, uh, the communities. I went out to the town of Hardwick, uh, we went out to the town of Peterson, <coughs> and that's how we started the very early stages of the most senior population was doing those community outreach clinics in their community. And that was a great success. And we taught those boards of health how to get vaccine how to go through the processes, fill out the paperwork, get a, get a number so you could actually get vaccine from the state shipped to you. Uh, we stored a lot of vaccine in Rutland because people couldn't afford that, that freezer. That freezer was $11,000, ladies and gentlemen. But we can turn that freezer down and put ice cream in it. So we knew for the long-term goal of Rutland, that freezer could be used for many years. So if it's not going to store vaccine, guess what? You can put ice cream in it for whatever event you're going to have. Um, so that worked out. That worked out very well um, for for the first few months. But of course, the state has to get involved in everything, and they they made the decision. They were stopping the community uh, outreach of, of these small vaccine clinics. So Jana called me back again, and she says, "Geez, you got such a success record. Everybody's buzzing about Rowland. How you guys how you guys got this done? Can you set up a regional vaccine vaccination clinic in the in the in the center of the state?" As you all know, Rutland has, famed, has the fame of being the center of the state. So I said, yes, we can, we can certainly do that uh, for you. Um, and we did. And uh, we ramped up um, after several meetings. Um, we ramped up uh, and started the first uh, clinics here at the library. Now, Carrie and the library trustees uh, basically turned their building over downstairs for 14 and a half months for the vaccination clinics, and we want to applaud them because yeah. that was huge. And have this, have this facility in order to, to do these, these vaccination clinics. I was talking with uh, Peg Sullivan, who has recently become our town nurse, and congrats to Peg. That's mm -hmm. a great uh, cluster of town of Rutland. Uh, <clears throat> Peg worked at the clinics. Uh, and became one of the lead nurses with Alan. Alan's right here and his wife, and his wife did a lot of the administrative work checking people in. But they were the two organizational lead nurses for the clinics downstairs who worked with um, MRC and other organizations that uh, provided nursing staff uh, to us, and they were the organization daily of, an oversight of, the, of those nurses. Um, not too far into the, the clinic operations, we, we felt that we needed to have a professional. Uh, I, had a, I had an everyday job here. I was still the health inspector of the town of Rutland. You all know how Rutland's been growing. Uh, so I still had to attend to all the perk tests and septic inspections and all the growth things that go on, all the housing complaints, all the restaurant inspections, etc. So even though, and it's a big joke, I have a t-shirt I should have worn today that my name is on the vaccine because literally... The state of Massachusetts recognized me as the holder, handler, keeper, and proper temp person of all the vaccine they shipped out here to Rutland as the health inspector. But uh, Kathleen Dixon is here on the board, overwhelmingly hired her, and I won't go through the process of how, how to hire her. But Kathy was the, was the daily um, uh, person who, who took care of all the operations that went on downstairs as far as registration, making sure that people got registered, help people when they need to get registered. Uh, the daily flow, uh, the organization of the clinic itself downstairs, 
Um, so, Kathy, it, we owe you a great uh, a round of gratitude for what you did here. On behalf of the Northern Water Health and all the of the Thank you. Um, being, um, being the uh, central uh, clinic, we outdid uh, many of the other uh, uh, clinics. And I think Peg mentioned uh, to the fact of 100,000 vaccinations, and she's holding a T-shirt that we all did for the staff at 60,000 vaccinations, and that's the T-shirt that was made for us then. And we were all proud at that, at that milestone to have 60,000 vaccinations completed here in the town of Rutland. That was just until June of 2021. Correct, yep. We ended the first round. Yep. And so. Wow. So the town of uh, Rutland uh, Board of Health is part of Region 2. Region 2 consists of 76 cities and towns, uh, with Rutland again being right in the center. We, uh, I said early on, gathered up 16 of the towns around Rutland, and we fed them vaccine, and they really became our close partners in this, in this process. When we opened up the clinic downstairs, it went statewide, and we had a state uh, mm -hmm. software program that the state rolled out to us, for folks to register and sign up to get their their shots, um, the first the first software was very good to use. Then, of course, the state and their infamous wisdom changed <laughs> softwares, so we all had to learn a new software. The software wasn't user friendly. We couldn't edit, and, and Kathy's uh, making faces back there because Kathy had to deal with <laughs> deal with the state, uh, deal with the software, and all the failures of that software. In the meantime, we were trying to get people through our clinic. Um, and so Kathy spent a lot of time on that. Uh, thank you, uh, getting people through the door, and that was important. Uh, just to give you some statistical numbers, um, Harrington Hospital vaccinated from 12, 16, 20 to 3, 31, 22, 54,000 people. Uh, Montachusetts Planning Health Network did 10,000. Metro West Regional Vaccine Collaborative, 16,000. Palmer Regional Vaccine Site, 12,000. Southern, Southern Worcester County Regional Vaccine Site, 24,000. Central Mass Regional Public Health Alliance Vaccination Site, 31,000. Town of Rutland Regional Vaccine Site, 100,000. So, so Central Mass, the Central Mass, again, Rutland shined with its bright lights and got 100,000 people vaccinated that wanted to be vaccinated from, from coronavirus. And, and that was a huge... Uh, a huge uh, milestone to, to complete. Uh, April vacation, a very cold week it was. Um, we did the first drive through. They did the first drive through clinic, actually. I was out because I had had surgery. But Rutland Heights property was utilized again, very important for today's discussion. But the property was used, tents were set up, and they did a drive through clinic. and. They did 1,500 vaccinations, 1,500 at that drive through mm -hmm. clinic. Another milestone for Rutland uh, that far exceeded any other clinic in the, in the Commonwealth for a drive through clinic of doing 1,500 people. Um, the weather was bad. It was rainy. It was snowy. It was cold. They were trying to hold the tents down, and Peg was still sticking arms with needles while the rest of the crew was trying to hold the tents down. Um, <laughs> Peg has a, a poster board there with some pictures on it. I have some pictures that I'll certainly leave uh, after today's presentation. I think there's one, two, three, four, there's six people holding that tent down, and you can see the rain coming down. Uh, but the clinic never stopped. These people had their appointments, they were in their cars, and the clinic never stopped, and they got the vaccinations. <coughs> Rich, may I point something out? Taken by Seth standing in the dry trailer. <laughs> uh, you can. You can. You can. Rich? He had, he had a very important he had a very important job in the command center. May I point something out too? Yeah, Kathy. Yeah. Um, hi everyone, my name is Kathy Dixon. It's an honor to work with all of these people, but what Rich hadn't mentioned, and then you try to remember back to that springtime. They planned this drive-through clinic during school break. We were going to use school property. The the, the hospital uh, driveway was a perfect circle. And hey, let's use Johnson and Johnson because it's a one and done. 
it's one and done, and, and we can have as many in the cars, and we're good, and we won't have to see them again. And a week and a half, ten days before, Johnson & Johnson was pulled because there were some questions about its efficacy or side effects. And so the state said, and, and these, I called them the Three Musketeers, Rich, Seth, and Scott. I called them the Three Musketeers because I always yeah. swore they shared a brain. Yeah. And um, so they were like, you know, it's okay, non Johnson Johnson, gung-ho. And I'm like, dude, like Pfizer and Moderna require a second shot. How are we going to get this 1,569 people back through our doors? And we did. We just, we, wow. came, they all came back in uh, two, three weeks to come to the library to get their second booster shots. And that week, the rain that he's showing you, uh, one of the gentlemen noticed that it literally that week was every single New England season was represented that week. We were hot one day to the point where we were in shorts and a t-shirt. <coughs> one day was rain going sideways. And one day was uh, single digit temperatures with ice and sleet falling oh down. It was the craziest. It was, you know, Peg's 75th birthday. Things had to get done. <laughs> so, um, but it was an amazing thing. And, it, and, and these guys were just, their answer is always, yes, we can do it. Yes, right can do it. And I'm just sitting back with Lynn Miller going, <laughs> okay, I'm in. But whenever this community and the communities around us needed something, these guys stepped up and that's when the creative thinking happens. And I really am from a military family and you do what you got to do. And there's a lot of human stories along with this too, but Rich failed to mention that when they planned this, it was really, really a, a compact, easily planned something. It's kind of cool. It's a drive through Johnson & Johnson, let us see you again. And uh, just the whole world turns on a dime. And you got you to be flexible and you got to step up. And that's what Rutland did. And I think that is part of this heroic micro story of this bigger, one chapter of this bigger COVID in Rutland uh, yeah. vaccination uh, book. Oh. So. Even though the clinics are very busy and we have sometimes lines out the door, we would do, uh, in our heyday downstairs, we would do eight to 900 people a day downstairs in those spaces. And, and many of you have been down in the meeting rooms in the spaces downstairs. We used every inch of space we had, uh, but we got people vaccinated. Um, Kathy was always uh, uh, the fun one and creative one. So this was Hawaii Day, and you can see a picture of her and Peg, so everybody wore Hawaiian shirts. And, and so just to try to keep it fun, because a lot of people were scared, a lot of people were uh, uncertain about this virus, they were uncertain about the vaccines, they were uncertain about getting vaccinated, so we tried to keep the atmosphere uh, light down there. Uh, we did bring in service animals, we had a pony down there one night, we had uh, all kinds of things, especially when we started vaccinating the younger children. Um, we had uh, the mascot from the Worcester Railers come out, so we had a lot of good uh, good guests. You'll see on that board there, there's a syringe that I brought today. And just picture us in that back room, the small little kitchen area that Carrie has down there, filling 100,000 of those syringes, because that's what we did. So paramedics, Chief Knight, myself, the nursing staff, the, the senior nursing staff, we would all come in two to three hours before the clinic. We already knew what the count was going to be for the day, whether it was 500, 700, whatever it was, and we would preload syringes, and we did that by the hour. Hours. Hours. Um, so there is a, a vaccine vial, I believe it's Moderna, that's attached to that, um, just to give you an idea of what, how, how the packaging was of the, uh, that was Moderna that came in, and we would, uh, you know, have to draw that uh, out into the syringes. The Pfizer initially had to be mixed with saline as a saline. Uh, vial on there as well. So the, the, Pfizer, the Pfizer vaccine had to be diluted, so we have to draw up the saline in a 3 ml syringe, put that into the Pfizer, shake the Pfizer 10 times, gently, because we didn't want to break the strains of the vaccine, and then we would draw, uh, draw up the syringes. So yeah, it was like basically like a baby, yeah, gently. Um, so this went on for days and days and days in order to get the, the masses vaccinated here in Rowland. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. So, uh, you know, some key people, uh, what use of Medical Reserve Corps certainly supplied great staffing uh, here in Rutland. Uh, Judy O'Donnell was a former health, a former uh, nurse in town, and now uh, Peg O'Sullivan is our, our Rutland nurse. Now, Peg continues uh, through the state database of, of uh, reviewing all the communicable diseases that come into Rutland. That's one of her roles. And uh, so she, she knows who um, is positive uh, today. Uh, she knows what the flu cases look like and all the communicable diseases. She does the case follow-up phone calls to those individuals um, and interfaces with them uh, as a public health nurse. So, again, thank you, Peg, for your work you're doing. Uh, well, the fire department uh, and Chief Knight, I can't say enough about Chief, Chief Knight, 
uh, worked with us daily. And not only uh, did he have his duties as fire chief here in the, in, in the town of Rutland, but he's also the emergency management director. And the emergency management director is the conduit from the federal government for all federal dollars that come in, especially an event like this. So he had, to, he had a, a mountain of paperwork to, to complete and send to the federal government uh, on a monthly basis. And then the checks would come in to, to Rutland uh, to support our clinic, to support our equipment, to support needs in the community that needed to be addressed uh, dealing with the, with the COVID virus. So uh, I don't believe, uh, I may be corrected, but I don't believe he gets any extra money to be emergency management director. I'm not 100% I'm not sure. There's something there for that. Might be a stipend, but. I know, but it's like. But he had, he had <laughs> for 14 and a half months plus, he had dual, dual hats on and he worked hand in hand with us every day. And every morning that the medics weren't out on a call, they were over here filling syringes with us for an hour or two before they started the regular shift at the, at the fire department. So I can't say enough about the Rutland Fire Department, his leadership and, and their support. Um, Council on Aging did a terrific job uh, getting our seniors signed up. They, they took the computer program and worked uh, many hours with our seniors getting, getting those folks signed up so they could have a, a vaccine. The library staff here did the same thing, carry staff uh, getting mm -hmm. folks signed up and fielding all those phone calls. And Carrie and I have laughed about some of them and cried about some of them phone calls that Carrie would get here uh, from, from, from various people. But the library staff, Carrie, the board of trustees, it just can't say enough. If we didn't have this facility, if we didn't have this support, we wouldn't have done what we did here in Rutland. Right. So thanks, thanks again. DPW staff, anytime we needed extra sanding or salting out here, as you can imagine, the traffic coming in and out of this library and around the church and out here on, on Main Street on some of those days was, was phenomenal. Uh, the police department helped us anytime we needed uh, crowd control. Uh, and, and occasionally we'd have an uh, irate customer, believe it or not, you know, because um, how come they had to wait in line or, or you know, they had an appointment somewhere else. Or, or what happened? Or, or they made their appointment online, but they got here and it wasn't in the computer. So, you know, uh, we tried to accommodate each and every one of those, and the staff did a great job to, to take care of that. The office town staff did, did a lot of work uh, in, in town hall, behind the scenes, copying um, and just providing um, supportive, uh, in a supportive role. Our collaborative towns, which is the 16 towns that we partnered partner with right up, right up front uh, around Rutland, and those boards of health and fire departments that, and, and paramedics that came and worked at the clinics on their shifts, uh, on their off shifts, came and worked to, to support, uh, support this. Uh, the UPS and FedEx drivers who brought vaccine to Rutland by the cases, I mean, in boxes and boxes of syringes and uh, saline and alcohol prep pads. And you just imagine the work that those drivers did delivering that stuff from the state. Uh, uh, to us and getting it inside town hall and getting it into the vaccine room which is a secure room in, in uh, town hall was, was phenomenal. Uh, we, we developed an early partnership with uh, pharmacists too because believe it or not everybody in the country was buying up supplies so we were running low on masks, we were running low on latex gloves, we were running low on non-latex gloves. We couldn't find an alcohol prep pad anywhere in the early days because everybody was buying this stuff up across the country uh, in preparation of, of, uh, of uh, vaccine clinics and, and whatever may be, be coming. So when I couldn't order stuff here in Rutland or I couldn't get stuff from the federal government or DPH in Boston, uh, I would call him and through his pharmacy, he was able to order stuff, the pharmacist was able to order stuff that we couldn't get. So that was a great uh, partnership that we developed and we certainly want to thank him for, for his role. And now he's been vaccinating, he, he uh, Rutland, Barry, and Spencer, I don't know if you all know Fred, the pharmacist, the lead pharmacist, but he's been doing vaccine clinics in the pharmacies for, for months now. And now he can order his own vaccine, but in the early days we would supply it through, through Rutland to him and transfer that to, to him. Um, the Wachusett Regional School District, phenomenal job. Um, the teaching staff, we were able to get vaccinated pretty pretty early to get them back in school. The nursing staff, we all took care of the, uh, their vaccinations. Um, they came and helped. A lot of the nurses came and helped. Um, we did clinics over at, at Naquag to get the, the schools back open and get the staff protected. Uh, and of course, the, the Mass Department of Public Health uh, was um, 
uh, I go to uh, many times, many phone calls, uh, many phone calls with Jana. Now, not everybody gets to Jana being the assistant uh, commissioner of public health in Massachusetts. I had her cell phone, and she would be talking to me at home at 9, 10 o'clock at night. Uh, that was another um, plus for us because I had that personal relationship with her way back in 1986 when we were both starting, starting public health. And uh, that was one of the one of the successes for, for Rutland because other people couldn't or didn't have that connection like I did. So uh, I think I'll end there. Um, I'll take any questions or if there's anything to add, Kathy. May I? Thank you. Yeah. Um, first of all, I think we also would like to thank Lynn Miller, the Secretary of the Board of Health. Whenever you call the Board of Health office, she'll be the one who answers it. She was absolutely essential and behind the scenes, and God bless her, kept her day job while the rest of us were running around like uh, Tasmanian devils. <laughs> Uh, of the many human interest stories related to the, uh, the, the, the the clinic, and if we ever get together and sit down over a case of wine and write the book, um, hey, can you hold up the shirt, please? One story that I would just like to share with you because this this uh, picture on the shirt came to us uh, one day in the clinic, and I think it was before all of the kids were approved officially, but there were it was approved for special need or special medical needs. And a mother came in with her, I think, early teenage son, and uh, I think he was a little older than he appeared. He may have been on the spectrum or seriously shy, but you know he got his first shot, and his mom attended him to the waiting room. And, and please remember, during the early days that Rich described, I mean, we're at the end of it. So we know it's a heroic story. But in the beginning, when we first opened our doors, people were dying. Mm -hmm. And the first uh, January, February, uh, the first day we had a clinic in this location, you have to tr please remember that the people who were eligible to receive this vaccination were 75 and above. Mm -hmm. but they haven't left their houses in over a year and a half, mm -hmm. decide to leave their houses, make it safe in the ice from their door to their car, make it safe from their home to the library, get out of their car, walk in the library. By the time they came to the door, they, some of them were shaking from nerves and um, would come in, and I think our record was 90 seconds. Like, yeah. to have somebody come through the door, be registered, be helped, have a shot in their arm, and be in the 15-minute waiting room, we averaged 90 seconds in the early days. And sometimes that stress of... The, it was interesting to me that the age group changes. The 75 and above, they, their responses almost unanimously were, I'm going to live. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm going to live, I'm going to make it. Mm -hmm. And then it was open to 65 and above. Their responses were, I get to see my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was fascinating. And then the young, you know, by the time the younger kids, so anyway, this young gentleman comes in with his mom and, his, and she uh, assists him. And of course, we get the peg to do all of the special, special uh, vaccinations. And this young gentleman won 15 minutes. He was trying to verbalize or communicate what this meant to him. And so he quietly came up to me with this little small piece of paper and while he was waiting 15 minutes, he drew this syringe. Oh. And from this syringe, if you get a closer look at it, yeah. it's blossoming flowers. And then there's other like little things, almost like fireworks. And it's basically new life. Wow. And his mom came up and said, my son, would, he's an artist, and he would like to give this to you. I think it was actually from Worcester because I brought him a shirt. And um, she wanted him to, he wanted to give this to us and the staff because he, this was this way of thanking us. And so he, I, we had this little scrap paper, beautiful hand rendering of this picture. It made it on our t-shirts and it made it on some of our publications and it made it on, um, I had some, um, oh yeah, there you go. Yeah. We had challenge, challenge, challenge coins. I had challenge coins made when we thought we were ending in June of 2021. <laughs> Uh, before we open back up again later. But uh, so I had challenge coins made for the staff. Again, as Rich says, at 60,000 uh, vaccinations. And it, that, that drawing is on that challenge coin. So this young man from Worcester who had no other way to thank us, thanked us in a way that he could. And then, like I said, it's one of many stories. But because it's, uh, if you can, come look at this shirt. The drawing is just impeccable. And it just, to me, when the peg held up the shirt, it just reminded me, I'm proud to work with the heroes, and I'm, I'm grateful for the experience, but there were some people that it was literally life and death, mm -hmm. and, 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 had no, and coming to the clinic and getting a shot was terrifying, terrifying. And so just, it was such an honor, and I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to hear it through Rich's, Rich's uh, lens about uh, his history and how it all came about, and I just sat back coming out every, home every day to my husband saying, I'm so grateful I got to meet these people and serve this community in this way, so, um, but that picture just reminds me of why we did it. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Before, uh, before I close, um, there's one statistical number I, I, I failed to, to mention is um, in the heyday of COVID in Rutland, we had 200 positive cases. 200. And we lost, no, we, we, we lost six 
individuals to COVID in Rutland that we know of that died directly from COVID mm -hmm. that we know of. But 200, that was our number during the heyday of COVID in Rutland. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any questions? Questions? Yeah. Lady. Sorry? Sit up. Anybody <laughs> that has been through this presentation and doesn't feel a huge <laughs> sense of pride in the town of Rutland has no soul. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's unbelievable, and I, I've always been proud of Rutland. But I, I never heard this whole story before, and it is absolutely amazing. Best work I ever did. Hi, Linda Salmonson Oberg. I was a newbie coming into Rutland from Holden when all of this started exploding. And I just have to tell you how, and I'm also a nurse. A lot of people know me from the high school, from other places that I've worked. Um, I was just so impressed, number one, that you are holding this in a library. And I, I, I imagine well, it's probably the only library in the state of Massachusetts that probably had such a clinic. Um, and very impressed with Kerry here and I, I just I this town is amazing this town is just amazing um, so thank you to everybody that was involved in this in providing this thank you thank you all for coming you going to wrap it up with yeah so yeah so I just want to say <laughs> Because you heard my connection to all this health care in Rutland, you know, some very personal connection. Um, but working with the clinic in my 55 years of nursing was the single most incredible experience of my career. Just an, an amazing experience and the fact that two years ago, minus a couple of days, we started that clinic in the fire barn. And the very first night, it was cold. When they opened the doors, the front door never closed. So there we stood, freezing. We learned our lesson, though, by, by the clinic and the, the drive through We had uh, heat warmers in those half gloves, and we would put our hands like this. And she's nodding because she did it. And we would put our hands like this, and as soon as we had somebody drive up, then we would pick up the syringe and run over and do the shot and then stick our hands back in here because it was so incredibly cold. So I want to thank but that's you a cure for all TV. for coming. And Ed and Tom and Rich and Evelyn and Bonnie, thank you from the bottom of